Go ahead. Go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our e-seminar series on transition biomedical engineering. It's uh, our great pleasure today to host uh, Professor Vijay Sanjiraj uh, from New York University in Abu Dhabi with us. Uh, he will be talking about 3D bioprinting and some of their uh, efforts in, in that space. But before we start the presentation, uh, we would like to remind everyone that if you have any questions uh, during the talk, please use the uh, uh, ask a question box, which is right at the bottom of the uh, your screen. Uh, also, feel free to uh, to communicate with the other participants as, uh, and us and also the speaker using the chat box, which is uh, on the right hand side. Uh, so our uh, next. Uh, a speaker is uh, Professor Jay uh, Kizakidato, uh, who is a professor at the University of uh, British Columbia in Canada. He is also a Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research Scholar and uh, also an associate um, uh, and also a professor at the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine and, and Center for <clears throat> Blood Research at, at uh, UBC. Uh, so make sure that you follow us on Twitter. Uh, with uh, our uh, uh, handle TransLBME and then uh, uh, and then also LinkedIn to get most up to date information about the next uh, talk. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to, uh, we would like to uh, to thank Montreal Transmed Tech Institute, who is uh, sponsoring these e seminar series and then who has been with us since almost the beginning of uh, these uh, these series. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, invite our speaker, Dr. Vijay. Uh, uh, Sanjeraj, uh, who is an associate pro assistant professor of mechanical engineering at New York University, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, before joining uh, uh, NYU. Uh, he was a research fellow in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at National University, uh, University of Singapore. He was the recipient of uh, many awards, including the President's uh, Graduate Fellowship award which is uh, awarded to candidates who show exceptional promise or accomplishment in research for his doctoral study at uh, at NY and US he was one of the six students in the whole faculty of engineering uh, in January 2015 intake to receive this prestigious fellowship his research interests include additive manufacturing 3d bioprinting and biomaterials for tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, drastic drug testing, and medical devices applications. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us, uh, Professor Sanjay Raj. Uh, uh, now the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you. Uh, can I? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Dr. Uh, Moses. And uh, here uh, from sharing work with you. Uh, just to start my journey, I uh, realized like from the east to the uh, So I was in a small place in the south of India called Plaza, uh, and then went east to New York, then uh, came to the middle of uh, New York. So this is painting. Uh, this is actually a photo of my hometown, just to how cool my home is. Uh, Vijay, to sorry, sorry to stop you. Uh, you are cut off. You are cutting off. I mean, like uh, your voice is not clear. So maybe your internet is not stable, or there's something wrong with the mic. But uh, okay. Are you connecting to a stable uh, network or? Yes, I am. Yes. Yeah, perfect. OK, maybe you can uh, try to to talk a little bit so we can let's see if uh, yeah. it's better uh, or not. I, I can put my point uh, away. Oh, so so Vijay, maybe the uh, the Chrome is still open. Can you close all the tabs on, on the Chrome? Or 
or maybe he can uh, turn off his camera also to have better bandwidth. So, can you? Uh, so, so uh, also, Human suggests that's a good suggestion. Maybe you can turn off your camera. So, uh, so Human, you can, you can, you can. Do I turn that. it. I turn it off. Yeah, I turn it off. Exactly. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Try Let's to... see if it works. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Well. well yeah. So yeah, let's start, let's start from the beginning, Vijay. So, like, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. So I'll I'll start from again thanking you. So, thank you, Dr. Mosen and uh, Dr. Herman for uh, inviting me to be here, and it's a pleasure to be here to share some of the works uh, that we do in the lab. So starting from my academic journey, uh, I realized I went from East to the Middle East. So I was born in this small town called Porlachi in the South of India. And then I went East uh, to National University of Singapore. And then I came here um, to the Middle East to New York University of Abu Dhabi. Um, the picture that you see here, it's, it's not a painting, but it's an actual photo uh, of one of the um, roads uh, from my hometown, just to show you uh, how impressive my hometown is. And then I went on to College of Engineering Gindi, one of the oldest technical institutions in Asia, to do my undergrad studies in mechanical engineering. And then, uh, interestingly, I moved on to work with Caterpillar uh, for three years in, in a procurement function. Uh, before I went to NUS to do my PhD and, and do my postdoc. Uh, and then I, I came to New York University of Abu Dhabi uh, as an assistant professor in 2019. So for those wondering uh, how did this um, undergrad, then industry, and then uh, to the PhD and academia worked out, uh, I recently uh, published a book uh, titled Navigating PhD. It's available on Amazon Kindle. Amazon.com, Amazon.ca. Um, so I, I talked about uh, important things while uh, deciding to do a PhD, starting from is PhD worth at all, uh, to how to select a school, how to select uh, a university, how to select a lab, how to get a good supervisor like me. Okay, I'll include you, Mohsen and Human too. So uh, if you want amazing supervisors like us, how do you select and, and so on. Uh, I, I heard very good feedback about the book, that it has been useful to so many. So uh, if you're interested, go ahead, uh, buy, read, and share your feedback with me. Uh, that's self-marketing. Now I'll market my university before I go on to the uh, uh, talk today. So uh, we are located here in Abu Dhabi, uh, which is the capital of United Arab Emirates. So NYU has three degree-granting campuses. Uh, denoted by the yellow ones, uh, yellow dots here. Um, of course, one at New York, one at Abu Dhabi, um, and the other one at Shanghai in China. And we also have uh, 11 other academic centers uh, all around the world, uh, right from uh, Ghana, Germany, uh, to Tel Aviv and Washington, D.C., U.S. So this is the beautiful uh, campus that we are in, and I'm currently at my office sitting um, and uh, Warm welcome if you guys are here in the region, do visit us, uh, we'll be happy to host you here. And just to give a snapshot, quick snapshot of uh, how diverse uh, our campus is, uh, we have 115 plus countries represented from our undergrad and graduate students. Um, that means we hear 115 plus languages uh, spoken uh, within the campus. And uh, it's one of the most diverse campuses I have ever seen. And, and I enjoy this diversity. Uh, so directly jumping into uh, the talk today, just to give a brief uh, introduction of uh, what my lab does here. Uh, so we focus primarily on three areas, 3D printing and bioprinting, a um, little bit of computational studies, uh, especially in the area of biomimetic design. Uh, and then uh, 3D printed medical devices. Currently, now we are focusing on uh, implants, um, some of which I, I'll be sharing uh, today. So I'm going to talk about implants, scaffolds, and bioprinted tissues, which are uh, some of the 
key applications of additive manufacturing in the biomedical field. So when Hooman asked me uh, the title of my talk, I gave 3D Bioprinting the Art of Engineering Tissues. So I just want to make sure if it's available in the dictionary. So I, I googled art and I did not find tissues and I did not find engineering. So I'm making a case today that, you know, we may have to urge Google, Oxford, uh, whoever makes the dictionary to include tissues and engineering uh, by demonstrating the three areas uh, in which uh, we are primarily working and some of uh, the works uh, in the area of design, fabrication and materials. So uh, first I'll, I'll go into the design aspects of it. I thought it's better to start from this classical problem. We published this paper in, in 2016 um, where we talk about the stress shielding problem that the current bone implants have. So for those who are not familiar with this topic, uh, most of the bone implants are non-porous, which means they are just a solid block of material. And because this implant has a higher mechanical property than the native bone itself. So when you put this implant inside the body, this implant shields the surrounding bones from uh, experiencing the stress uh, during the normal physiological motions. So that we call stress shielding. And due to this, you know, there is implant loosening and you have to go for a second surgery and so on. And the second challenge we see in this field is there is lack of biomimicry. So by biomimicry, I mean the implants that are currently available does not mimic the native architecture of the bone. So given the limited choice of implant materials, uh, you might be aware we are stuck with titanium alloy, TA6AL4V and 316L stainless steel you know, we have limited uh, implant material choice there. So that's when we thought changing the design of the implant can reduce both these uh, or address these uh, challenges. So that's where we came up and proposed uh, using a TPMS based implants, right? So what are TPMS? This is called triply periodic minimal surfaces. These are mathematical surfaces, just like you can define um, a circle and a square or a rectangle by an equation, you can define these structures by an equation. And then by tweaking uh, the various parameters in the equation, you can get different kinds of structures you want. So uh, what you see here on the screen, these are um, three popular TPMS surfaces. The first one uh, is a primitive surface. The second one is a gyroid. And the third one you see here is a, a diamond uh, uh, surface. So these surfaces have a very high surface area to volume ratio, less stress concentration and increased permeability. So um, we did a lot of study to, uh, to understand how, uh, you know, varying the unit cell size, how varying um, the, the wall thickness of these structures can actually result uh, in uh, different uh, mechanical properties and different surface area per volume ratio. And, and we also demonstrated that we can create a functionally gradient structure uh, using these um, TPMS-based uh, unit cells. So if you look at uh, the bone structure here, uh, so there is a hard cortical bone outside and then there is a spongy trabecular bone inside and even within the trabecular bone the properties vary uh, along different directions we call it anisotropy so we just demonstrated uh, computationally that you know using these tpms structures we are able to design such a functionally gradient scaffold here it's a very simple design where we just assigned uh, you know different unit cells and uh, different properties of the unit cells uh, to the outer cortical bone and say inner trabecular bone, right? And we went on to print it using various uh, materials. So the one you see on the screen here uh, is a ceramic material, um, alumina, and we printed it using um, a stereolithography apparatus uh, printer. 
And then we went on to do a lot of experiments to see uh, how the compression modulus, the fracture strength, and other mechanical properties can be varied by varying the cell size and thickness of these structures, right? I gave all this introduction to, to understand the uh, research gap we still face uh, in uh, biomimicking the bone structure, right? If you look at all the designs that I showed before, these are still lattice-based or unit cell-based structures, which means it's very difficult to mimic the anisotropy. So if you look at this um, uh, gradient structure carefully, this region where you know there is a change of unit cell or a change of geometry, this area is not very nice. Right? Technically, there, there will be a lot of stress concentration here, there will be a lot of weak points here during fabrication and so on. Um, so, we really cannot uh, mimic the bone with these unit cell based structures or lattice based uh, design. So, that's when we thought having a stochastic porous scaffold design will be able to better mimic the native bone microstructure. So what are stochastic structures? These are heterogeneous structures uh, and they can be made from a randomized collection of points or randomized functions whose outcomes are geometrical objects. Now, what do I mean by that? So if you take any specific volume, say one centimeter cube, right? So you can divide the one centimeter cube into several different subdomains. For example, we have 27 points um, identified here within uh, this particular uh, cubic structure. And the advantage of uh, the design approach uh, that we have developed here is you can assign any function or equation to each of these points and you can assign any amount of porosity or pore size to these points, right? So I'll, I'll give you a few uh, designs that we generated using this approach, right? The one you see here on the screen, these are all uniaxial uh, gradient structures, meaning we change the uh, porosity. Uh, so there is a gradient of porosity, 58% to 70% in the x-axis. Similarly, 30 to 70% in x-axis, 50 to 80% in x-axis, just to check the versatility of, of our approach. Right, and then uh, we went on to do a biac. Sorry, Vijay, to to interrupt. Uh, one of the participants yeah. is asking whether you can uh, hide your uh, taskbar, which is in the bottom. They're interested in in um, uh, seeing your uh, uh, references. Oh. Maybe hide. Yes. If not, then then maybe later. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, so maybe later you can share. Uh, so Diego, uh, please take note uh, uh, of, of this slide and then we can ask the, the, uh, our speaker to share the references with you. Yeah, please go ahead, Vijay. Okay. Um, so we did um, a biaxial uh, functional, functionally gradient structure as well. Uh, so we, we tried the same different porosity gradients, but in two axes, both X and Y. And we also did tri-axis uh, again, where we did um, the same porosity gradients uh, in all three axes. And just by comparing these screens, you can see how different and smooth uh, flowing structures that we can generate uh, using this approach. Now for uh, those who, who want to know how we did this, um, so the reference is there, it's still under review, we haven't published this paper yet, um, so um, uh, it, it'll be out soon, uh, hopefully. Uh, so we used Mathematica software and we also used MATLAB uh, to generate uh, these structures uh, basically by, by, by coding um, uh, the required uh, steps that, that we want to generate these structures, right? So we went on to fabricate these structures using um, different materials. So the one you see on the left is using clear resin and a Formlabs 3D printer. Uh, we also printed using a nylon material using an EOS printer. And we also did uh, print them using uh, 
316 l stainless steel uh, with with another eos printer here so currently uh, we are um, focusing on uh, the animal studies uh, just to compare how uh, these structures help in a better biological activity better bone regeneration uh, etc we are currently working uh, on the animal studies uh, i hope to share um, the results uh, with you guys soon if, if there was another opportunity so that's a little bit on what we do in terms of design um, i want to focus also on uh, fabrication where we work a little bit on uh, hybrid uh, 3d printing bioprinting techniques so um, for this particular talk i just chose one project where uh, we used electro hydrodynamic jetting and extrusion bioprinting um, to print um, uh, 3D human uh, skin uh, structures. Okay, for those who are wondering what is electro hydrodynamic jet 3D printing, uh, if you guys know what is electro spinning, where we apply a very high voltage between the nozzle and the substrate, and you kind of pull the polymeric fibers uh, out of the nozzle uh, using the electrostatic force. Okay. Uh, and we have worked on, you know, various different kinds of uh, scaffolds um, using the ESD jet printing uh, method. You know, I, I show a biomimetic meniscal scaffold here for tendon repair, multilayer skin scaffold. And we also extensively worked on nerve guide conduit for neuronal regeneration. But for this talk, I'll just focus on one particular project on 3D bioprinted human skin. So this project was uh, sponsored by uh, A-Star in Singapore uh, when I was back uh, at NUS uh, and also Procter & Gamble um, is one of the largest skincare uh, products producer in the world. So uh, I, I don't want to go into the details of how the skin looks like, but the takeaway from this slide is the skin is a layered structure. Right, so it's it's easy to use three D printing or bioprinting to create these uh, layered structures. So uh, this was quite an exciting project for us because we had skin biologists in the team, um, we had um, clinician scientists in the team, uh, and we had uh, company representatives in the team. We had engineering um, uh, and various. Uh, um, departments within engineering we collaborated together to to bring this uh, project to fruition right so we came up with a very good process flow of how to create an in vitro uh, human skin and what we did was to compare whatever we produced using this uh, method of 3d printing and bioprinting with the manual method of organotypic cultures um, that is usually and traditionally followed uh, in, in industries such as PNG and other life science laboratories. Okay, so I'll just highlight some of uh, the interesting things that, that we got out of this project. Uh, number one is we 3D printed the PCL mesh. We used it as a well insert here, and then we had an acellular base layer of collagen, collagen based hydrogen, right? Again, this was a learning point for us. As an engineer, I didn't know uh, why we would need an acellular-based layer. But the skin biologist gave an input that, you know, the human dermis does not have, um, you know, these peaks and valleys as we have uh, in a meshed PCL structure. So they don't, uh, they, they did not want the fibroblast uh, to just attach to uh, those different fibers in the PCL mesh. Rather, they would need uh, a very homogeneous uh, dermal layer or the, the layer that has a fibroblast in the human skin. So that's when we introduced this acellular base layer, which would actually go into the PCL, it will settle. And then we started uh, printing um, the fibroblast layer on the top of it. So we had human fibroblasts, we mixed it with the collagen hydrogel. And of course, we did a lot of optimization there uh, to get a smooth printing. And then after two to three, three days of incubation, we went on to print the uh, next layer, the epidermal layer, uh, using keratinocytes. Again, these are human keratinocytes um, um, suspended uh, in collagen hydrogel. 
Uh, and then um, after a few days of culture, uh, we did the air liquid interface lifting um, to finally characterize if whatever the skin formation was right. And then um, interestingly, uh, you know, whatever is done manually is comparable with whatever uh, process that we suggested, you know, using this P uh, PCL mesh, uh, using the uh, collagen hydrogel for fibroblasts and then the collagen hydrogel for keratinocytes. And one interesting uh, thing that I wanted to say is because we combined these together, this PCL mesh we used um, not only uh, gave the structural support, but it also uh, prevented the shrinkage of collagen, right? So this was a great uh, relief for life scientists, uh, especially those who use collagen, because collagen is known for shrinking after some time. And it's very difficult to, you know, prevent the shrinkage of collagen uh, for, you know, say day 14 or day 21. So we were able to maintain um, this structure uh, up to day uh, 20, um, at least in a decent way to do all the tests that, that we, uh, we uh, needed to do. And these are some um, colorful images where we uh, studied the layer specific markers, the basement membrane cell junction, we compared between the manual and um, the bioprinted skin and, and we found um, bioprinting to be uh, a good procedure compared to the manual thing. And the advantage here is while doing it manually requires skill and you need a lot of people with bioprinting and this kind of process, technically uh, you can automate the whole process, which is good for industries like uh, Procter, Procter & Gamble who do uh, a lot of drug testing, cosmetic testing, etc. So I just wanted to include one more slide here just to show one other approach of getting a vascularized dermal construct. So this was kind of a follow-up work uh, that we did uh, after we finished uh, the project with PNG and ASTAR. So we sandwiched the endothelial cells between two fibroblast layers and all we wanted to check is if the endothelial cells are intelligent enough to form capillary-like structures or lumen um, you know, to create a vascularized dermal construct. And uh, after a lot of optimization with the bio inks and the printing parameters, we were able to successfully demonstrate that on day six, uh, after bioprinting, um, you know, we saw capillary-like lumen structures um, in our construct uh, and thereby demonstrate. So the cells we used here uh, was a human embryonic stem cell derived endothelial cells. So technically, we could use iPSCs in the future um, to create these kind of uh, vascularized uh, skin constructs um, or any other constructs where vascularization uh, is a challenge. Now, um, the last part of my talk, um, I would take uh, a little more time uh, in, in this section because we are uh, working currently on, on these uh, topics here. So when I came here to Abu Dhabi, I, I realized we needed a lot of bioinks to do bioprinting. And for those of you who work on bioprinting, you know how expensive is a little vial of bioink if you have to buy them commercially, right? And uh, from our personal experience, some of the commercial uh, bioinks, you know, they, they do not work uh, because of various conditions, right? The kind of cells we use are different the kind of atmosphere here is different and so on. So we started to explore this idea of, uh, you know, creating our own bio inks in the lab. And that's when we started exploring um, various sources to, to isolate or formulate, um, you know, uh, the bio inks that we can use in the lab. So I, I've seen, I've shown in this slide, some of the uh, works that we have uh, successfully done in the lab. Um, so I'll, I'll go from the bottom up because I'm going to talk about the top one uh, in detail uh, in the coming slides. So we derived cellulose and nanocellulose from, you know, watermelon rinds and the banana stem. So basically uh, I started bringing um, the, the rinds from my home after eating my watermelon every week. And similarly, you know, as Indians, we cook uh, uh, anything that, that comes with banana, right? So banana stem again is one of our favorite dishes. 
So I thought, why not we take the cellulose from the banana stem? And that's when uh, we, we started uh, thinking of, you know, getting cellulose and nanocellulose from um, these two things. And we were successful uh, in isolating them. And we are currently doing some tests to formulate the bio ink uh, and, and uh, further testing of these materials. And we were also successful in isolating uh, fish skin collagen from grouper fish um, that, that we get here. Uh, I mean, we are located um, near the sea, so it's, it's easy to uh, get it from the port. Uh, so what I'm going to focus uh, today is these structures called tunicates. So these are some marine organisms. Uh, and these tunicates, they come under the phylum chordata, right? So, you know, they are the closest invertebrate relative to humans. Uh, for those of you interested, you can, you can read more about it. Uh, there are plenty of information available online about this. And uh, evolutionary biologists are really interested in studying this because they are the closest invertebrate relative to humans. Okay, the first time we saw it, we did not understand what are these. We thought these are, you know, uh, plants, um, and then we had to do um, the, the sequencing to understand what species it is, what uh, animal it is, and, and finally we found these are called tunicates, and uh, they are also called as sea squirts or acedians. Now, the bad thing about these tunicates is they are invaders. They are called fouling tunicates. So as you can see here, these tunicates attached to the bottom of the ships and the vessels and they travel uh, from a foreign country to the native, um, I mean, uh, our coast here in Abu Dhabi. And they are a big threat to marine ecology. Right? I'll explain you why. These organisms are called filter feeders. So they kind of filter the water by eating all the zooplanktons and phytoplanktons um, in the water and they grow very vigorously and they overtake the local marine ecosystem which means the local fishes and other uh, marine organisms they are denied their food and hence the the local uh, economy um, gets disturbed right so we identified these and we thought why not we use these uh, for creating some of the biomaterials that we would want and that's when we did this first uh, step here, first project with the tunicates, where we tried to use them in three different ways. The first line you see here, so what we did is we harvested these tunicates, we cleaned them, we decellularized them, and then we lyophilized them. So I don't know how clear it is uh, on the screen, but if you look at it carefully, the lyophilized a uh, tunicate um, looks like a paper okay it's very lightweight it's paper like and it it can be easily transported anywhere and the greatest advantage of these lyophilized papers is on revetting it you know either with pbs or with any of the cell culture media it immediately kind of regains uh, its hydrogel uh, structure so within, we have done extensive studies on this. So within 24 hours, you get the full uh, or close to full uh, structure that, that uh, was before lyophilization. So we tried to use this as uh, exudate absorption uh, for or a wound dressing material. And we just did uh, an artificial wound model. We just compared the absorption capa capacity um, of these materials uh, with the commercial dressing materials. And we found that the capacity of these lyophilized um, tunics are almost 20 times its weight in the dry state, uh, approximately 2x of the commercial dressings uh, that, that we tested in the lab. And the second route we followed is we try to use them as a natural decellularized ECM scaffold, right? So ECM is extracellular matrix. So we tried with uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts. We uh, cultured the mouse embryonic fibroblasts on these scaffolds and we found the, the scaffold uh, you know, worked really well 
and after a few days of culturing, uh, we could actually see tissue formation uh, on these natural scaffolds. And the other uh, interesting advantage that we found is the tensile modulus of these decellularized ECM structure uh, is close to four megapascals. Uh, if you compare it against the other hydrogels uh, that are reported, um, you know, they are somewhere between 0.1 to 1 megapascal. And uh, people are working hard to uh, strengthen um, the hydrogels using various materials like nanocellulose and, and, and other uh, inclusions in it. And having been successful with the DECM scaffold route, then we thought, why not we make a bio ink out of it, right? So we made a bio ink out of the DECM um, lyophilized structure, uh, and then we made a uh, we we um, mixed the mouse embryonic fibroblasts in it, and we did the bioprinting. We optimized the parameters, etc. And again, we found um, that the cells were happy. Um, and uh, we were successful in, in bioprinting it. So we wanted to take this to the next level of, because MEFs, uh, they can survive, uh, you know, some harsh environments, they are fibroblasts. So we wanted to try um, neural stem cells, human neural stem cells, and see if we can differentiate them into peripheral neurons on these DECM scaffolds. So we did that and we were successful in differentiating the neural stem cells into peripheral neurons. So if you look at this uh, PCR graph here, HNK1 is a stem cell marker, so it is down-regulated. And we have uh, beta-3 tubulin, which is a pan-neuronal marker, which was up-regulated. And then uh, PRPH is peripherin, NEFH is neurofilament heavy chain. These genes were also up-regulated um, on the DECM scaffolds, right? So then we thought we can bioprint. Uh, it should be an easy job. But when we started bioprinting, so uh, if you can see here, this, uh, this row of D, E, and F, we did not use matrigel because uh, when we used the DECM scaffolds, we did not coat them with matrigel. And the cells were fine, they attached, uh, they differentiated, they worked very well. So we thought this is very conducive to neural stem cells. So we can make a bioink, directly mix them, and then we can bioprint them. But when we did that, the cells did not survive. And we hypothesized uh, uh, that, you know, the, the stress that the cells undergo due to extrusion process um, you know, was one reason why uh, the, the cells were not happy and, and, and they were all dead. So we had to uh, use matrigel, which is um, kind of a basement membrane that you use for culturing any kind of stem cell. So we started trying matrigel and we had to mix matrigel with the DECM bio ink. And uh, after a lot of trials of different uh, concentration, um, you know, we figured out that 26% matrigel and 10% DECM was the best for neural stem cells. Now, again, uh, I want to highlight two things here. When you do extrusion bioprinting, um, two things become important. One is printability and the other is, you know, you have to make the cells happy, the biological activity of it. So we had to go through a lot of iterations to, to find this particular concentration uh, where, you know, we, we were able to print um, good structures and at the same time, uh, the cells were happy, living, proliferating and uh, differentiating. So um, these are some of the images after uh, uh, optimizing the bio ink uh, and we found um, the, the cells were happy and they could differentiate into uh, peripheral neurons uh, in this. And we also saw certain alignments of uh, peripheral neurons. So we are still uh, trying to understand, uh, you know, why this alignment happens. Is it just due to the printing process uh, or is it the material um, or any other um, uh, reason that uh, these peripheral neurons are aligned? So actually alignment of peripheral neurons is good uh, because uh, if you look at certain nerve guide conduits, um, you know, they give specific morphological cues uh, to align the neurons, 
right? So alignment here is a good thing. So we are still studying uh, why this alignment happens. And uh, we also wanted to study the translational ability of you know, the, the projects that we do. So this is one step. This is a very small experiment that we did at the end, uh, but then um, it, it's one step closer to translation, right? So now that we have printed neural stem cells, and we have differentiated them into peripheral neurons. Say, if I have to send it to a hospital for the surgery, right? Of course, we cannot expect the hospitals to have all the facilities to bioprint, to culture cells, etc. So, off-the-shelf products are always better, right? So, we thought, why not we do a freeze-thaw study? So, what we did is after bioprinting. Uh, the human neural stem cells and after we differentiated them into peripheral neurons we kept it in minus 80 degrees celsius with the freezing medium um, for a week's time and then after a week we took we took them out and we started reviving them we started thawing them uh, for another week to see if the cells recuperate from this shock of uh, being freezed and then thawed again and uh, interestingly, comparing the DECM scaffolds, the bioprinted neural tissues were much better in terms of cell proliferation uh, after uh, this 14-day uh, cycle of freezing and thawing. Okay, so one hypothesis we have here is, you know, we have matrigel in the bioprinted uh, structures and we don't have matrigel in DECM scaffolds. That could be one reason. But we still have to uh, study further to, to understand this. Uh, so this would be my, my last uh, uh, few slides uh, about um, the cartilage tissue engineering that, that we used um, one of the tunic scaffold as well. So whatever I have showed earlier on neural um, uh, bioprinting, neural tissue bioprinting, so it's made from a different spe uh, species of tunicates. So that is polyclinum uh, constellatum, right? And we found another species of uh, tunicate, uh, which is called Fallusia nigra. And uh, just from the look and the feel of uh, the tunicate itself, we thought, you know, it, it could act as a um, cartilage. Uh, it's a good material to, to make cartilage. So we again started decellularizing them. We made a DECM powder and then uh, we made a, um, you know, bio ink out of it, and we also wanted to try the DECM scaffold route. Um, and then, interesting thing was, you know, we were able to remove all the pigments from this particular tunicate, and the hydrogel construct or the DECM scaffold was very transparent. Okay, so there clicked an idea why not we use it for uh, developing cornea. So we are working on a project on, you know, corneal bioprinting and uh, um, DECM-based um, um, corneal tissue engineering in the lab. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we went ahead with uh, culturing the um, human mesenchymal stem cells on these uh, scaffolds. Um, and we also did bioprinting with it. And we were able to differentiate them into um, chondrocytes. Um, so the alcyon blue staining and the saffron no staining showed uh, in a good chondrogenic uh, differentiation. And we also studied the expression of collagen uh, 1 and collagen 2A. Uh, and this is a work in progress. We are um, still uh, working to, to improve uh, further uh, on, on this particular thing. So now that I've talked about all of these, I hope, uh, uh, you know, we we can now say Google or Oxford, you know, please include tissues and engineering uh, when you define art, because it is actually an art um, to, to engineer tissues uh, in the lab. So with that, I want to uh, acknowledge my fabulous research team um, here at uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. And I also want to thank uh, all the sponsors uh, for giving us the funding to, to carry out all these works. So thank you so much and, and looking forward to interacting uh, with you over the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vijay. Uh, you can stop sharing and then uh, take a breath and then I, I go through our next speaker slides and then uh, 
Yeah, so that cross in the middle, sure. if you just uh, click on that cross, you can just... Uh, okay. In the middle of the, the screen, you can just stop sharing. I'm just trying to find the Safari thing. Okay. Yes. Ah, okay, and then I have to turn on your... Okay, perfect, uh, the camera. Okay, perfect. So, uh, so I'm just uh, sharing my screen to go... Uh, to our next speaker slide. Okay, uh, next week uh, we are hosting uh, Professor Jay uh, Kizake Datu. Uh, uh, well, there, there, there's, there's no slide. Ah, uh, there's no slide. Uh, just, uh, just hold on a moment because uh, this one probably has some problem. Um, okay, Mosan, is it uh, shared? Not yet. Okay. So there's some something wrong with my screen. Uh, is it shared right now? Yes. Okay, so next week we we, we will be hosting uh, Professor Jay Kizake Datu uh, from the Department of Pathology and Lab Me Laboratory Medicine and uh, uh, the Center for the Blood Research at the University of British Columbia. This talk is also sponsored by Canadian Biomaterial Society. Uh, please make sure to uh, uh, to follow us on Twitter uh, with the handle TransLBME to get the most updated information of uh, uh, the upcoming seminar series. We, we continue this seminar series uh, uh, to the summer and beyond the summer, hopefully. And uh, uh, please, uh, please uh, share your, uh, you know, you can, you can also uh, share the speakers. If you want uh, like a specific uh, speakers come to our e-seminar series, you can suggest the names and then we invite them to, uh, to come and speak uh, about their uh, translational uh, research. Uh, by that, thank you so much, uh, uh, Vijay, for your great talk. We have a couple of questions on, on the question box. Uh, from our audience, I go uh, through them first, and then I go through my own question as well. So, uh, Misop is asking. Uh, uh, he he was really fascinated by the by your talk, and uh, he has two questions. The first question is that was the uh, was the porosity or pore size of your scaffold? What was uh, the porosity and pore size of the scaffold, the skin scaffold? And, uh, and these uh, human dermal fibroblasts are supposed to migrate into the scaffolds, or I, I, I imagine that they are inside the buying, right? Or, uh... Yeah, they are. So okay, please. The, the product, uh, PCL uh, itself was um, around 100 to 150 microns, if I'm right. Uh, but, but it was. Uh, but to answer the second question, which is important. So we have this PCL mesh at the bottom, and have an acellular collagen layer, right? So this acellular collagen layer is to prevent the cells from migrating into the PCL mesh, right? So I think I highlighted this uh, very briefly in my talk. So what 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 was our idea is you know just to have a PCL mesh and then directly bioprint on top of it. But then the skin biologist said, no, that's not how the human dermis looks like. So they would need a very homogeneous distribution of cells within the dermal layer. So we do not want uh, the cells to actually migrate into the PCL scaffold. So that was suspended inside uh, the bio -ink. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, a follow-up question from uh, Misa that is that like about the degradation of the skin scaffold. Uh, was that important in your project or not? Um, actually, not because uh, we were looking at uh, you know more of a cosmetic testing uh, platform. 
So where if you have the, the structure good for say um, three weeks or four weeks, that was, that was good enough. Um, so we were not looking at, you know, skin uh, for regenerative medicine applications. So we did not actually look at the degradation uh, of, of these structures. Thank you so much. We have uh, another question from Vahan. Uh, he's thanking you about uh, uh, your, your outstanding talk and about the 3D bioprinted bone implants. Uh, it's known that the metal implants and metal, uh, metallosis may increase the odds of the infection related complication, including multidrug resistance. On the other hand, presence of the cavities can cause hematoma, which creates favorable conditions for infectious agents. Prosity of the bone implants will indeed favor the osteointegration, uh, but uh, won't it also create higher infection-related risk? That's a really very scientific, uh, detailed question. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll try to answer that. <laughs> I don't know if I'm 100% right on it. So, of course, the metal implants, metal losses will definitely increase the infection-related complication, no doubt in it. Uh, but the, the problem is the current market standard is that is all we have, right? So, mostly we are using uh, metal-based implants. And what we tried is to just uh, work with the current implants and see if we can... Uh, bring that to uh, at least a, a better level where it can serve as a scaffold. So of course we need to, so that's why if you, if you look at one of the TPMS slides uh, that I presented, we also tried printing them using a ceramic material. Um, so there are a lot of works uh, that, that has to go into that space. So in order to study all these, uh, that's exactly what we want to do. Uh, when we go for the animal studies, which we are we are currently uh, working on, uh, to study this interplay between the architecture, the material, uh, and uh, the biological aspects of it. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, I have a question about this uh, vascularization in the skin bio uh, skin graph that you printed. Uh, are those uh, vascular networks perfusible or? I mean, did you use like coaxial printing or just uh, laid down the endothelial cells in between the fibroblast layers? So um, what we try to do is try to use the intelligence of the cells itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we do. So uh, in fact, it was a self-assembly of the cells mm -hmm. to form lumen structures. So whether it is perfusible, um, we are yet to study. but. Uh, we were happy that, you know, um, so uh, I didn't explain it in uh, detail, uh, but actually we, we played around with a lot of parameters there. So, uh, you know, the, the infill of the fibroblast layers were like 70%, but the infills that we used for the endothelial cells are 30%. So they are like spaced apart when it, when it came to the uh, endothelial cell uh, layers. Um, and then this was actually... Um, um, building upon the experience of uh, my collaborator uh, back in the dental school at NUS, where they studied extensively, uh, you know, these self-organization of cells uh, to form lumens. And that's when we thought, why not we try uh, a vascularized dermal construct using that approach? Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we did not use any other external techniques to actually form the lumen. It was a self-assembly. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, the audience uh, were asking about the ref references of these uh, because it was kind of masked by the taskbar. So the first TPMS, it's under review. As as uh, I think I noticed that you said that it's under review. The skin, the skin printed, uh, by printed, the scaffold is published, right? So the the TPMS one was there, but then the one on stochastic scaffolds, it is still under review. And then okay. I had two for the skin. One is the vascularized and the other one is... Um, so maybe you can share also the links in the chat box uh, for, for those who are asking about the references because they could not find it in, I mean, see it on the slides. I shared your Google yeah. Scholar, uh, but I think maybe because you publish a lot, maybe they cannot uh, find those specific uh, publications. Yeah. So... I, I just send all of those. So oh, yeah, yeah exactly. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, OK. 
Okay. Perfect. Just one more. One more, okay. Perfect, thank you so much. So uh, Diego and uh, Nafisa, I think, asked about the, the references. So you can find these references here. And then uh, also for the more comprehensive list, I, I also shared uh, uh, Vijay's uh, Google Scholar. So we can go and check the other publications as well. So about the tonicate, uh, by ink, I really, I was fascinated. And uh, uh, um, as you know, we are interested also to use your <laughs> by ink. But uh, one one question that you, you you mentioned that okay like the cells are happy and you know one of the the important thing is the like extrudability like the the the, the ability to be extrudable and also the uh, the happiness of the cells or biocompatibility and this stuff but like have you checked the immunogenicity and like in vivo biocompatibility because biocompatibility cannot be really interpreted outside in vitro so we have to check it in vivo uh so or like or do you have any plan for that uh yeah yes so that's what exactly uh so we are like um compiling all our projects together and we are trying to do a mass animal study now so we are getting in touch with the lab in india who can you know do these uh experiments for us uh in the animals uh, I mean, one of the things I was happy about the tunicate bioinks is if neural stem cells can actually survive in it, then it has to be biocompatible. So, I mean, uh, at least in the in vitro uh, stage, because um, I think you work with iPSCs and stem cells, so you know how challenging it is to, to even culture them uh, on a 2D culture plate, right? Let alone 3D printing it. Uh, so, uh, that's when we, we thought, okay, this has some promise. Uh, and then, yes, you're right. We are now moving into in vivo biocompatibility first, uh, and then probably uh, some defect models, be it on skin or cartilage. Uh, you know, we are working on that uh, now. Perfect, perfect. So hopefully next time when uh, you are here, uh, you can present the new results of this. So now I stop here. I pass to Mohsen, who has difficult questions for you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Roman and BJ. No, I don't have many many questions to ask. I think I missed uh, the part that uh, that you talked about uh, tunicate, uh, maybe the composition. But I wonder what is the main component of of uh, the tunicate ECM that helps with all the cell growth and then then uh, all these uh, biocompatible features. Yeah, it's predominantly cellulose based. Cellulose based. It's cellulose, okay. but then you have. Some those aminoglycans and other uh, bioactive compounds available, but it's predominantly cellulose. So sure. after trees, I think this is the greatest source of cellulose in the animal kingdom. Uh, you don't find cellulose in, in a lot of other uh, animals. I see. Okay, that's great. And then I have uh, one last question uh, about the, uh, the, 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 the 3D printing of bone constructs uh, that you showed in the first part of your presentation. Uh, well, what, what is the minimum resolution that you can achieve using those printing techniques? Uh, so I did not show one of those. So we even printed nano size structures. So we have mm. a nanoscribe printer. So uh, that's that's our exact idea of to see how uh, you know small we can go and how big we can go. So mm -hmm. um, we tried everything in between. So we tried nanoscribe at the nano level. Mm -hmm. uh, so the macro size, if you take with the nanoscribe itself is only a millimeter or maximum mm -hmm. a, a centimeter, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, stitching that you do. And then we tried, you know, form labs and um, the, the nylon printer mm -hmm. mid-size and we do, you know, uh, metallic printers. So I think that way uh, those structures are uh, really Excellent. So, so would it be fair to say that uh, you can use different 
printing methods or like you can you can generate basically gradients of uh, pores so that you have smaller pore sizes at the edges where that are in contact with with tissues and then larger uh, you know pores in the middle is, is that like a fair assumption or, or statement yes it's possible so okay i mean we have mimic the bone structure, the anisotropy of the bone, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is possible as well. Smaller pore size at the interface of the tissue and the scaffold, yeah. and then the larger size uh, in the middle. It is possible to do that. Okay. Okay. That's great. Uh, there's, I, th I think I'm done, but there's one, one question from the audience. One more question from our audience, and uh, this is more general, and uh, I'm also very uh, interested to know your answer. Uh, Namdi is asking what uh, have inspired you, your research idea, and uh, coming to this kind of working with the biomimetic bio inks and other kind of you know bioprinting. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean it's not a, a one-line answer that I have, uh, but you know during my PhD, what I did was I had a core thing to focus on, uh, which is my PhD and the thesis. But then I also did a lot of hard work to, uh, you know, branch out the core into different ideas. So if you look at the TPM as part of it, that was not my PhD, nowhere related to my PhD. But I was just fascinated when some other student was working on these structures for, you know, energy absorption applications. So uh, I went ahead, talked with him to see, can we use it for bio applications? And, and uh, that's the paper that we got out of that collaboration. So um, that's how I branched out. And when I came here, uh, you know, like I said, we faced, uh, you know, this bio ink crisis. So that's when we started exploring locally to see, you know, can we create our own bio inks from whatever we find here? And that's when we started finding tunicates. And then I thought, you know, I eat watermelon a lot. Why not we try something out of the, the waste I get? And uh, so it's a combination of people uh, you know, challenging situations, etc. Uh, and I'm glad some of my stupid ideas actually worked out uh, well. <laughs> no, that's great. That that that's what that's a smart idea, not the the other. Okay, uh, okay. Thank you so much, Professor Vijay Sanjari, and I uh, hope uh, you know. Uh, to, to hosting you here in Montreal or Victoria or uh, seeing you in uh, Abu Dhabi one day, uh, not virtual, uh, maybe next time. And uh, thank you, uh, audience, for uh, joining us today and always, you know, contributing to, to the Q&A uh, uh, session. It's really uh, a dynamic and interactive session. And uh, I invite everybody to join us next week, uh, same time, same place. Uh, and uh, take care of yourself until next week. And thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a good one.